In the last few videos, we saw how instructions flow through our five-stage pipeline, and we saw how to resolve data dependencies. Now I'm going to introduce the concept of bypassing or forwarding, which helps reduce the stalls introduced by these data dependencies. So let me start by just reminding you of what we had seen last time. If you look at this example where instruction 1 is producing a result in R3, and instruction 2 is reading the value of R3, let me just show you how those instructions flow through the pipeline, right? So we said that instruction one basically does instruction fetch, decode and register read, followed by the ALU computation going through data memory and then writing the result over here. And we said that the result gets written into R3 in the first half of that fifth cycle. If you look at instruction two, it performs the instruction fetch here sorry, this is instruction two, it then, it then does the decode and the register read in this third cycle. It realizes that what it has read from the register file is not correct, so it repeats that operation two more times. Finally, in the second half of cycle five, it reads the correct value of R3 from the register file and then proceeds. And as a result, you have these two extra cycles that you spent in the register read phase, and that leads to two stall cycles. So bypassing is trying to avoid these two stall cycles. So without bypassing, we were assuming that all values are exchanged between two instructions through the register file, right? So the producer has to put something into the register file, and then the consumer has to read that value from the register file. And what that introduces are these additional delays or gaps between the producer and the consumer. So with bypassing or with forwarding, what we are exploiting is the fact that even before the value gets written into the register file, the value is still available somewhere in the processor pipeline. It is typically available in some latch and can be used as input by whatever ALU stage or whatever data memory stage needs to consume that result. So let me explain how that's done. So again, let's look at instruction one going through the pipeline just as before. Its behavior is unaffected. So it goes through these five stages without any stall cycles. Now you'll see that this second instruction wants to read the value of R3. So let's track where that value of R3 is at all times, right? Let's say that R1 was five, R2 was seven, and the result that you're producing is 12. So if you look at the latch over here, right? So I'm just going to draw the latches on the left just so you know that they exist. So this is latch L2, L3, L4, and L5. So at this point, once you've read, once instruction one has read the register file, it knows that the values of R1 and R2 are five and seven. So those two values are sitting in latch L3. Once you've performed the math in cycle three, you have figured out that the sum of those two numbers is 12, and that's sitting in latch four. Now over time, in, this, in the fourth cycle, that value 12 just basically moves from latch L4 to latch L5, right? So 12 is now sitting in latch L5. And then eventually it gets written into R3 in the first half of that fifth cycle, right? So the value 12 was available as early as over here, right? It just basically moved from latch to latch until it finally got written into register R3, okay? But the value 12 was available earlier. So in some sense, the end of cycle three is the point of production. This is when the, this is when the producer actually produced the result. After that, it was just navigating through various wires and latches until you finally found your permanent home in register R3. But the value 12 is available in latch L4 at the end of cycle three. So the question is, can I use that value in some way? Now let's look at the second instruction that's trying to consume the value R3. So it reads the instruction in cycle two. It reads something from the register file in cycle three. Okay, and so what it's putting into latch L3 is some old value of R3 and the correct value of R4, right? So what is sitting in latch L3 over here? So in L3, you have old R3 and you have correct R4. Okay, so now if you look at the ALU over here, it's getting an input from old R3. It's getting the correct value of R4 both of these inputs are currently coming from latch L3. And we know that one of these inputs is incorrect, right? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to push I2 ahead into the ALU stage, and I'm trying to see if that's, if that's even feasible. Okay, and in this case, 
if I2 were to proceed to the ALU stage, it's getting the correct input for R4 from L3, and then it's getting an incorrect value of R3 from L3. Now, we've already seen that the correct input, the correct value of R3 should be 12 and has already been produced and is sitting in L4. So what we need to do is take the output of L4 and somehow move it towards the input of the ALU, right? And have a multiplexer over here saying that, you know, sometimes I get the input correctly from L3, but sometimes my correct input is sitting in L4. And I'm going to decide on the fly where I should be getting my input from. Okay, so it's possible for me to put I2 into the ALU phase and do the correct operation. But what I need to do is somehow get the correct input from L4 and discard the input that I'm getting from L3, at least for the value R3. Okay, so this is what forwarding is trying to do. It's saying that when I need to consume a result, I'm going to make sure that I get my value correctly from the right place. And in some cases, I may have to bypass the register file, right? Normally, I get my inputs from the register file. But in some cases, the value may not yet have been written into the register file. And in those cases, I get my input from some other latch, some other latch that is temporarily holding on to that value and has not yet put it into the permanent home in the register file. Okay, so one other concept I should introduce here is that if you look at I2, when does it need its inputs? It needs its inputs right before it starts executing on the ALU, right? So the point of consumption is the start of cycle four in this example. So if you look at I2, it needs to consume its inputs right before it starts executing on the ALU, right? And so if you let I I2 just flow through the pipeline as normal without any stalls, thankfully, the point of consumption is after the point of production, right? And so we know that it is possible to bypass the result from the producer to the consumer without having to go through the register file. So having explained this concept, let me now just work out this entire example without making a mess on the slide. So we've seen that you know, I1 is simple. It just basically goes through the five stages. And what I'm also going to mark is where I'm getting my inputs from. So if you look at I1, if you look at the ALU, it's getting its two inputs from the latch that sits between the register read stage and the ALU. Right, so this is latch L2 between these two stages, L3, L4, and L5. So in this case, I'm getting both my inputs from the register file. So my two inputs are from L3 and L3. Now let's look at I2. It comes here, moves to the register read stage, then goes ahead to the ALU stage. It needs two inputs, R3 and R4. R4 is the value that I read from the register file. So it's whatever value I read in this cycle here and put into the latch between those two stages, which is L3. So the value R4 is coming from L3. The value of R3 is whatever was produced by the previous instruction, that is at time over here, and that is currently sitting in the latch between the ALU stage and the data memory stage, right? So that's latch L4. So R3 is coming from, sorry, is coming from latch L4. Next, I2, once it's done that math, proceeds onto the data memory stage and finishes over here. Right, so these two instructions finish in back-to-back -back cycles without any stalls between them. Now let's look at this third instruction here. It does instruction fetch here. It's trying to read R3 and R8, right? So it tries to read from the register file in cycle four. It gets some, some old value for R3, but it gets the correct value for R8. So when I3 goes on to the ALU stage, R8 is whatever value it read from the register file, which has now currently been stored into latch L3. The value of R3 is the bypassed value from I1. Okay, so where exactly is that value sitting, right? So if you look at I1 again, it produced the correct value of R3 here, which was the number 12 I'd said in my example. And that value was sitting in latch L4 and served as input to I2 over here. In the next cycle, that value 12 advanced from that latch to latch L5. So if I3 wants to read the value 12, it has to get that result from this latch. So the value of R3 is obtained from latch L5. And once it's got those inputs, it does the math, computes the result, and you know puts that into the appropriate latch, and then I3 advances here, and then finishes up over here. Right. So with bypassing or forwarding, I was able to make sure that 
these three back-to-back-to-back -back -back instructions finished in back-to-back-to-back -back -back cycles, and there were no stall cycles between them. And what this now introduces is an ALU, which does not get its inputs every time from latch L3, which is what we were doing before. Now, every ALU input could come from one of three possible places. So I now have a multiplexer before both the inputs, and this multiplexer is fed with three possible input values. It's L5, L4, and L3. Right, and same thing here as well. What this means is the input is possibly coming from an instruction that is executing right before me. Or my input is coming from an instruction that is two cycles before me. Or my input is coming from an instruction that is more than two cycles before me. And if that instruction is so far before me, it's already put its result into the register file. And so I'm essentially getting my result from the register file, right? And so that's why L3 denotes a value that has been read from the register file. So any instruction executing on the ALU could be getting its inputs from one of these three places. And I'm making sure that I have these bypassing or forwarding paths that allows me to get values not just from the register file, but from an instruction that is, you know, right before me or, you know, two cycles before me and has its results stored in some temporary latch.